John Murphy, my name is, I'm from Cork, Upton County Cork, where I'm a racehorse trainer. My father was a cattle dealer, farmer, and he had horses as a hobby. He used to keep a couple of show jumpers with Robert Splain, and he had the odd point of pointer with, I remember one he had with it. A friend of ours, Ted Lorden. He um, he had horses as a hobby, but he, he was a good rider, good judge of a horse, and good producer of horses as well. We were living on a farm. We grew up on a farm with ponies and then show jumping. We had a few ponies, a few good ponies that... We went around the country with and RDS and that kind of thing. There were six of us and Jim, my brother, he runs the stud and nobody else in the family. Sarah rode a bit as a child, but nobody else is involved directly in horses. They have a real life. No race horses here. We uh, just ponies and then I went on to horses and then I went to Irish Kellets for a year, or a year and a half. And then I went to Harvey Smith's for two years and then came home and set up at home, show jumping. National level, we, were, we would produce nice horses and sell them all over. In those days, it was difficult to. To I wasn't a good enough rider to, uh, to go to the top, and and knew that from an early age. So, but the producing was working away well. So. Sell them on to the top riders. We used to break a few horses, and for people, and then we got we bought a few pint pointers, and it, it worked. We worked out well. They won and we sold them. And then we had a good few that we were planning on the derby sale and I think it was around the foot and mouth time. So pound of pints, everything were off. And um, we had been buying foals and selling them as three-year-olds, but foot and mouth came and then they became four-year-olds and five-year-olds and we had to run them and they worked out well. Some of them worked out well and we sold them. First winner was called Kilbuy King. Belonged to a friend of mine, Jim Condon, in Clamel. I was hoping to mix it, but the kids were growing up and the show jumping, I didn't want to be away every weekend. And the... Um, it just migrated more towards the racing. And we kept a few show jumpers with Francis Connors, Robert Splain. And uh, then it went fully racing. It's difficult to mix both in, in, a, in the one yard you can't with coughs and disease. And so you, one or the other. We had one of the first ones that we, Barry Garrity used to ride him, a horse called Inneskeen. Again, belonged to Kevin Murphy and a few friends out in Inneskeen. And it was, it was, he won a good few. It was great fun more than, you know. It was unselling, yeah. You, you had to, to survive because we didn't have big owners. We didn't have access to expensive horses. So you had to... Um, make do with what you have and hopefully they enhance their value and keep the yard going financially. And the owner came into the yard and, and asked would I take a horse and he, he worked out really well from the start he was a very good horse and had been a good horse with Tom O'Leary. So he went the right direction and everything worked out. He, 
he had loads of class obviously and he was in great shape he was um he'd won the kinlock bray he went on better ground which is usually cheltenham he was a very fast jumper and very slick and um the build up was no problem there were no issues everything fell into place double symphony king lucifer came from here classified take control there were a good few of that we sold on for from pine to pines and there's young horses and we used to sell to David and Martin, Martin Pipe. So we sold them a lot of good horses down through the years. They went on and won a good few. When we started selling to Martin Pipe, he was, he had an, already had a huge interest in French horses and didn't buy too many here. But he probably pioneered the whole French thing and obviously he's one of the game changers in jump racing with the records he's broken. And he, um, he was a brilliant sorcerer of horses, obviously, and as well as being a top trainer with a great business mind and I think it's the the stakes are very high now at the national hunt level, but I think you can still buy very good horses if you again think outside of what is the high fashion. I used to really like training the jumpers bar the injury factor. I found that very hard mentally. Um I think a good horse in either is great pleasure and I think the same rules apply with training them just good work riders good gallops health but to say which one I prefer I think I would love a mix if you had the um, like we started with point to pointers and Selling them and some were easy to train, some weren't. I think the same is true in the flat. A lot of it is mentality of the animal. So There's a lot of constants in National Hunt. Like they've become expensive. Um, it's a lot of new stallions that you don't know the fragility of their minds. I think you have to be a very sound mind to to be a top national hunt horse, both actually, both codes, but I think there's a long wait with jump racing. There's a great um, thrill in having a top jump horse. Some of those, like the jump meetings are electric. I think the flat is, for us, it's a little bit cheaper to buy them it's um you know your fate a little bit quicker um and the market is very international i had always an interest in the internationalism like the show jumping of the the the, the jump racing is ireland england france predominantly and i like the fact that the market is bigger on the flat and I love the fact that there were less injuries. And a friend of mine, great friend, Lord rest him, Mick Buckley, had, uh, we'd spoken loads about his business, which was on the flat. And we bought a few brood mares and we used to buy a couple every year and it worked really well. We, we have about 10 mares, which we try to keep at a better standard and um, they if they're really 
perfect confirmation, we, we'll take them to the sales. And if we think they're a racing type, we'll race them. And I think you're, you're less forgiving if you have a winner to sell on. And that's where we are. We buy about 12 two-year-olds every year. And hopefully they'll be one or two good ones that will pay for the ones that aren't. And it works pretty good. I think the best we've had is Tuscan Evening. She was, I think she was the first crop of Oasis Dream. Bought her a new market and she was second in the guineas and demoted because of um, interference. And uh, we sold her on then, we sold a percentage of her and it was a really wet summer and we moved her to California because she was really, had to have firm ground, quick, fast ground. And she was very high class. There's no doubt it's um, becoming a stronger and stronger market. They're in the Middle East, Australia, they're America, they're all your competition at the sales now because Irish horses do well in every corner of the globe so it's the it's the source is a concern because we can't access the top end so and a lot of the people that have the top breeds keep them in-house to race them so they're actually never going on the market so you have to think that that's what you'll be racing against which it is getting tougher yeah it is getting stronger the, the prices are growing. I think all sales companies turnovers and averages are up repeatedly every year. George said that he that Roger Callan had a really nice horse that he thought a lot of and we should look at him and George went to see him, loved him and Tally Ho and Roger would be one of the best in the world at producing top horses. So when they say that, you, you listen. And he went and saw him and loved him. And we did a deal and that's his, that's how he came here. He's by Ulysses, who's doing very well. He was a really good racehorse himself. He's out of a sprinting mare which is a concern going to the Derby. But he's, um, his pedigree is good. Again, Shively Park, one of the top producers of top horses. So they bred him. Ran in Asia, yeah. ran a lovely race on heavy ground. The farm stacked up really well. So he was, came out of that fine. It was towards the end of the year. Well, then he went to Dundalk and he won nicely. And we thought then that he is everything we thought. And um, he just thrived and thrived and trained very well over the winter. Built up to a big powerful horse, so it all went good. And um, the new owners bought him after the Dundalk race. Well, it's lovely to, to have somebody that endorses your opinion of a horse like the owners, and they have had horses with us, they're great supporters for a long time, and they were told about the horse and they, said they would like to, to buy him and lucky for us we can keep him. We always thought he was really high classed and he went on like good horses do, they, they progress. And then when he started winding a bit up in 
February. George always thought he was going in a really good curve, so it it seemed that he was really high class then. We have a wood chip gallop, we have a sand circular gallop, and then we have a, a six far long fiber sand. And then we have um, grass gallops, so we have plenty of facilities. We're blessed with the likes of Billy Callahan, Sinead O'Sullivan. We have some really good work riders who constantly give their best. They're natural horsemen and women. And I think we're very lucky to have good facilities. Um, I think a lot of the the show jumping, the people that come from show jumping have a great school that we love to hear that somebody is a show jumping writer or like Oshin Murphy. He used to be around the ponies there with George. I think some of the top racing jockeys jump jockeys would be top class show jumpers. I think the stable management with the show jumping people is very good with the the actual veterinary side of care. I think it's meticulous. Um, I think the riders that come from show jumping have uh, they have a a bit of an edge. Since George started, he's he's now top and tail of it, and he's um, he's addicted to it, and good work ethic, and it's easy for me now. He was on the pony teams in the show jumping, and he. He was on the Irish pony teams and travelled around Europe and that kind of thing. And then he did the National Stud Course. And then he went to Australia. And he rode out a good bit in Australia. He then went to Florida and rode out in Florida. And um, he did a short stint in Ballydoyle. And then he came home after all that and still here. Firstly, a good mover, an athlete. Um, something that looks bright and smart and walks well. Good head. Good power behind. And not the obvious ones that is going to be a Dubawi or one of the top stallions that you know you won't be able to afford anyway. So, but you can't have a brilliant pedigree with a bad athlete. That won't work. I think a good horse can come from anywhere. The the like the land in Ireland is conducive to rearing horses. The climate is ideal. The people that rear them are usually very, very bright. The um, the breeds are here, but you can get a very good horse from America. We don't care whether where it's bred really, as long as we like the model. It's open to being French, German, doesn't matter. I suppose there are so many f flops in first season series that commercially for us, just buying them is too tricky. You can, um, you can have 
a lot of money invested in first season SARS that could wipe out your year if you if you buy too many of them. So we try to stay proven. I think you have to start by thinking that um, can you see it in a winner's enclosure somewhere? And you still have to be a good looking horse to sell after winning. So, because some of the agents or somebody will come and see it and it must look the part then as well. So it must be a good looking horse from the start. So we're buying to win or to run well to sell. There are definitely some sires that I like. There's no doubt about it. I like to see them up at the ring because you see a little bit about the temperament when they come up to the, the razzmatazz. They, some of them are fragile and you see a lot about their movement and the way they, you see the temperament up there. I like to see the way they stand and are they calm, are they, I like to see a horse walking towards you. Um, I like a horse with a bright eye, good ears, good backside, and then the movement. And if there's loads of those come together, you'll probably find that you want to try and buy it. What makes a good stallion, I suppose, is no different to the show jumping as well. Um, for a horse to prove himself from moderate opportunities and that it gets better every year. My father used to say that um, it's the horses make the pedigrees good. And it's good stallions that make good pedigrees. So I think a stallion that rises himself and improves the quality of the pedigree are the ones that are that will end up the top. There's so many get chances that have two hundred mares and um they're also probably given a certain percentage of that 200 being very good mares. And then they can be actually dreadful stallions if they're not really good in the first couple of years. So the, that's important to know the, the opportunities that a stallion has got before a decision is made on it. We keep 10 or 12 brood mares and um, we go to studs everywhere, ideally trying to go to proven stallions. You're, um, you have a lot of investment and you don't want to be one of the sad stories that the stallion worked out no good. So I like the, the breeding, they kind of enhance each other because if we have a uh, a black type mare or filly we tend to try and keep them to to breed from them unless it becomes unaffordable that we have to sell i think um there's a big difference between ireland england and when you compare it to france and australia i believe that the authorities in Ireland and England need to handle the bookies revenue who are the biggest beneficiaries I believe that it's very clear that the French and the Australian systems are working far superior and it's all about revenue I believe that the the best racing is in Ireland and England. It's where people want to be. And if they don't address it, it will decline. And 
there's some strong action needed to bring back revenue from the firms that are gaining the most. The Jockey Club, the Turf Club, HRI have to be a lot stronger with the, the, the people who are governing the rights, the media rights, the betting rights and you can say they will just not put on racing but they will have to put on because people want to bet on the the big racing the important racing the best racing so i think they have they have to be a lot tougher i suppose to be fair to tracks they have some of them put on a band after the racing and there's live music there uh, maybe they should introduce a little bit more free racing. Like I remember one time in Longchamp, there were it was free access for anybody who wants to come in, and you probably stimulate young people to enjoy a sport that they're not exposed to. And um, maybe incentive like that might. draw people to appreciate the sports. I believe that the bar has been raised by serious trainers, serious jockeys. The professionalism is like show jumping, like other sport as well. It's at a, a very supreme level. And that's because of the competition, which is healthy and it raises the bar and it lifts all boats. I don't think there's any easy side to racing. Costs are bigger. Um, good riders are becoming increasingly hard to get. Um, I think being a dual trainer puts an awful lot more pressure on the people that are running it and the staff. But it also has some source of some bit of income throughout both seasons. Um, I think if you're up for it, both are both are fine if you if you can source the horses and have good facilities. I enjoy the show jumping. I like the producing I miss the fact that we can't do it here anymore but I enjoy the following through young horses we've sold um, I like music I suppose trying to improve every year improve the facilities um, have better horses every year to try and get into an area that you have a better quality animal. Um, producing better horses to run in big races all over the world. That, that's our reason to get up. I think you have to do both. You have to, if you, if you have people that want to put horses with you, they must um, enjoy the journey and but you also need to I don't think that a stable like ours could survive on training fees because costs are so big maintaining gallops insurance transport all that type of thing needs a lot of we need to probably focus on selling as well as having partners and owners. It's a must. You need both, I think. I like, it's, we're so lucky to have George as um, running it. He has a new knowledge of the industry. He grew up totally in it, whereas we paddled the canoe al along. So, we learned as we went, 
but I think he has a more in-depth knowledge of the industry and modern with his peers. After a bad day, there's always tomorrow. You have to get used to disappointment and be stoic about it and think it'll get better. <laughs>